Welcome to the Seekers Forum with Mark Matusik. On this edition of the Forum, Mark talks about what the shadow knows. Now, here's Mark. I'm very excited about what the shadow knows, discovering our secret knowledge. And I'd like to start out with a quote of Thomas More's that has always stuck with me. He writes, The only morality adequate to the complexities of life is one that has been sculpted in the presence of shadow. Let me repeat that. The only morality adequate to the complexities of life is one that has been sculpted in the presence of the shadow. Now, I can remember reading that sentence for the first time many years ago and being struck by how profoundly true it is. You know, so often in spiritual life, and in psychological self-improvement programs. We are taught to transcend our shadow, to avoid our taboo parts, and to look down on aspects of ourselves that don't fit into the feel-good, you know, be-your-best-self model that encourages us to focus only on the light. Rather than investigate our own dark corners and recognize them as integral, potentially rich parts of who we are and what makes us whole, We're encouraged to spiritualize away our unspiritual parts, to whitewash our inconvenient truths, and to reject aspects of our existence that seem unvirtuous, unsacred, and unholy. Instead of recognizing our shadow and its contents as the thing that gives us character and depth and individuality, We aspire to an idealized version of ourselves with the broken, awkward, crooked parts taken away, the secrets, the mischief, the transgression, the so-called badness. In this black and white puritanical view of what our enlightened selves would be like and what it means to live a good life, we struggle to cut away the human in favor of the divine and spend our lives feeling faulty, conflicted, and ashamed of who we are in our totality and the ways in which we never quite succeed in embodying this so-called higher self. Now, most of us are at least partly aware of how this philosophical split happens in us. Filtered down through outdated religious beliefs that carve the world into opposing sides, material life, including the body and its pleasures, set against spiritual life, down through families that hope to protect us by making us respectable citizens, and beyond that, to a punitive culture that survives through fear and control. We're inculcated with the belief that we are born bad and in mortal spiritual need of sanitizing and self-suppression. We're taught from the time we're very young children to be afraid of who we are, as if each of us carried within her or himself a time bomb of evil waiting to explode, a kind of danger zone of sin and destructiveness, whose landscape we must in no case explore. This is comparable, psychologically and philosophically, to children who are afraid of the boogeyman. You know, if we only stay under the covers and don't peek our toe out, or God forbid, look under the bed, we'll be safe from this make-believe monster who's just waiting to drag us into the dark. That's how a lot of us actually live our lives, terrified of the dark and scared of what we hide but don't understand you know who we would be without our spiritual clothes on this avoidance keeps us childish judgmental and paranoid full of self-doubt afraid of freedom and also deprived of the enormous power that comes from opening you know, spirituality is always about opening integrating body and heart heart and loins high and low, dark and light, you know, blessing ourselves in our totality and viewing ourselves and others through a humble, adult, shameless lens of self-acceptance and full disclosure. That's what Thomas More means by stating that the only morality adequate to the complexities of life is one that has been sculpted in the presence of shadow. Nothing else is big enough. If we hope to flourish and grow and be free, you know, to end the war within ourselves, we must be open to life's contradictions and allow our dark parts to be revealed, to give the devil his due, so to speak, 
and interrupt this lifelong struggle to be better than we are. Now, of course, this is not an argument for complacency or moral decline. What it is, is a reversal of how many of us are taught to think about spiritual development. Embracing the shadow, blessing our dark parts, allowing our flaws and limitations to be, doesn't mean we no longer seek to improve ourselves, awaken from our ignorance, or transform what wants to be healed. Instead, what it does do is clear the way for authentic growth to happen holistically and organically by acknowledging our shadow with less punishment and turmoil. Instead of approaching spiritual life as miserable sinners in need of redemption, we instead learn to approach our chosen path or practice as whole human beings who are fundamentally good. That's a paradigmatic shift in how we view ourselves and the world, especially for those of us who were raised with the idea of original sin and coming into this world with a black spot on us that we we spend our lives trying to wash away. By accepting the shadow, we're actually less controlled by its dark materials. We're less manipulated by our own denial and less likely to act out or betray ourselves due to things that we don't allow into awareness. We're also less likely to fall into despair, which is what happens when we try to cut off large portions of who we are and find ourselves lost in the midst of our own lives, unable to recognize just what's wrong and why we feel so partial. Let me give you an example of that. Years ago, a very dear friend of mine found herself in a terrible depression. Carol had been a good Catholic girl who grew into a good Catholic wife and mother. She had been terrified by the nuns of her girlhood into fearing and fighting everything to do with her body. Even though Carol had a great lust for life, She was the kind of obedient girl who did everything she was told to do, including saving her virginity for her husband, mothering two daughters by the age of 23, and generally being the perfect wife, homemaker, attending church, helping her neighbors, and generally doing whatever anybody needed of her. Carol was was the go-to person whenever you needed help or a warm heart or a shoulder to cry on. She towed every line that was laid out for her and always put her own desires second, judging herself for her secret growing unhappiness and struggling to keep it all together under one big smiley face. But then the smiley face collapsed. What happened is that when Carol was about to turn 40, she reached a breaking point within herself when she was forced to admit that nothing in her seemingly perfect life, you know, from her two perfect daughters and her white picket fence, her place on the Sunday planning committee, felt real or alive to her. Nothing gave her joy. Carol found herself going through the motions of living, increasingly confused and depressed by the emptiness, a kind of a soul sickness that seemed to be deepening and spreading inside her. She did her best to deny her painful feelings, but it was no use. She just couldn't function. She sought out the advice of a priest who recommended a church-sponsored therapist who seemed, after several sessions with Carol, both baffled and annoyed by her condition. None of the platitudes were working. From there, she was sent to see a psychopharmacologist who prescribed a series of SSRIs, antidepressant drugs, that did nothing but actually leave Carol numb and unable to cry, which scared her and concerned her more than the pain itself. Now, as Carol's friend, I was deeply distressed to see her sinking into this fog, And I encouraged her to do what I always do in my own life and what I do with my students, which is to write about her deepest feelings. I asked her to write about what it was that she longed for the most, to speak with the voice of her wound, and to try to tell a secret that's so shameful that she'd never revealed it to anyone else. These are the kinds of questions that, as a seeker and as a teacher and as a writer, you know, I've used to find my way through, through dark and confusing times. Well, Carol was unhappy enough to be willing to try anything, and she made a commitment to doing writing practice for 20 minutes every day. 
the very first week that she sat down to look at some of these questions, Carol had an insight that completely floored her. It took her aback you know, in its obviousness and its intensity. Writing about her deepest secret, Carol admitted something that she had never told a living soul, even herself, and that is that her perfect marriage was, in fact, empty and dead. That it had been years since she made love with her husband, that, in fact, they no longer slept together in the same bed, and that, worst of all, he never touched her. He never touched her, not even with passing affection. When Carol wrote this down, it was like touching a chord so deeply buried in her that she didn't know it was there. And she wept and wept and wept at this realization of just how unloved and untouched she'd become in her own life. Not only was she ashamed of the fact that he didn't touch her, but she was ashamed even more deeply of how unlovable she must be for her husband to reject her in this way. She felt unwanted, untouchable, and unseen, as if she no longer existed. And this sadness in her had actually metastasized and spread like tumors of grief in her being. No sooner had Carol admitted this piece of, of her secret, that a trap door seemed to open up inside the shadow that dropped her into an even deeper, more ancient sadness. This was the sadness, the coldness of Carol's own father and her inability to connect with him, to earn his approval or his love. This paternal rejection from her earliest memory was actually the bottom line. It was the ground level of Carol's grief. And when she realized this, she told me, something gave way inside her. It was as if a door opened up between her and the parts of herself that she just couldn't look at. Seeing herself not as a failure or a loser or someone unworthy of a man's love, she instead began to see herself for what she was, which was a grown-up girl seeking tenderness from a father who was no longer alive via a husband who did not touch her. That was the double bind that she found herself in. It reminded me of what William James said, that touch is the alpha and the omega of affection. Carol was forced to admit that this loneliness was just no longer tolerable for her. It was no longer an option if she wanted to stay alive. In therapy, she told her husband what she'd learned about her own depression through writing. But instead of, of hearing her and being sensitive to her pain and, and her insight, he actually scoffed at what he called her crybaby problems. The therapist made it clear to Carol that her job as a wife was to let it go, to obey her husband, and remember that, quote, the Lord had died for her sins. Well, with the encouragement of all of us who loved her, Carol filed for divorce within the month. Three years later, she's a changed woman. Not a perfect woman, not a perfect life, but a changed woman. Living alone with her daughters, dating her half a yoga teacher, and studying to be a psychotherapist. Her husband, by the way, remarried within the year. Now, none of this would have happened had Carol not been willing to look at her shadow and discover what it needed to tell her. The contents of our shadow, the, the causes of shame, self-doubt, confusion, and loss of vitality, uh, tend to fall into four major categories that I'd like to discuss with you today. The first is the body and all it entails, including sex and mortality. Next is imposterhood, the sense of not being real, worthy, or good. Next is greed and the animal desire for more that most of us struggle with, that is also inextricably linked to feelings of unworthiness. And finally, we come to the longing for redemption that haunts many of us throughout our lives, the sense of, of needing to be forgiven, to confess, to surrender, to be somehow saved. These four aspects of the common shadow link to most of what we hide in our lives, the unacceptable, unsayable, unbearable things that are hidden and trapped inside us. When the heart is freed from its benevolent captivity in ordinary morality, Thomas More writes, then what does it want? 
When the heart is freed from its benevolent captivity and ordinary morality, then what does it want? Where does freedom take it? That's the question that we're going to be exploring today. Where does freedom take us when we move beyond the confines of ordinary morality and what we consider to be acceptable in ourselves? So let's look at the four trap doors of shame and how they affect our comfort or discomfort with the totality of who we are. We begin with the body and sex, which is where all shame begins. Why is the body so shameful to us? Because the body contains secrets about how each of us moves through the world as an erotic creature with emotional and physical needs. The body seems to contradict so much of what it means to be good. There seems to be an unbridgeable gap between the equanimous, clear-seeing being we know ourselves to be and the hungry, hurting, flesh-hungry thing that we are when we're left to our creature selves. There seems to be an unbridgeable gap between those two things. In fact, there's nothing more humbling than confronting our own animal nature because the body does not obey our ideals. It suffers. It gets sick. It gets fat. It gets rejected. And finally, the body dies. Instead of making sense, the body tends to make trouble and pleasure and other undependable things. Inhabiting this uppity body, we tend to ping-pong back and forth between indulgence and self-judgment, unable to find the middle way. We struggle for absolute control while failing miserably time and again to cut our two-sided nature in half. And yet, why should we struggle so hard to suppress the animal self? Why? Where does this shame come from? Human beings are not meant to be reasonable only. As D.W. Winnicott, the, the psychologist, said, we are poor indeed if we are only sane. We are poor indeed if we are only sane. There has to be room in human life for transgression, for beastliness, for, for laziness, for, for not trying, for allowing ourselves to be our animal selves. This is part of our recovery from perfectionism. It's also why the body is our greatest spiritual teacher, because it's always there to remind us how perfect we're not. Miraculous, yes, but perfect, no, never. And that's why the shadow matters in the same way that the body does on the path of, of awakening. It's the shadow that makes us individuals. It's the shadow that contains elements of our history that are both dear and unbearable to us, our deepest parts, our losses, our wounds. It's the shadow rooted in the body that gives us character. Remember the word character comes from, comes from the Greek for etching. You know, life etches itself into us through shadow. Imagine an oil painting, a portrait, that didn't have any shadow. There would be no depth. There would be no perspective. There would be no shape. And that's the common mistake that many of us make in spiritual life, trying to spiritualize the shape away, to, to transcend the particular and wander off into the absolute. We need to remember that the soulful side of us, the body as well as our emotional, vulnerable, ground-dwelling selves, constitute the whole human being, along with spirit. Empathy comes from embodiment. You know, if we didn't have bodies, we couldn't feel compassion for other sentient beings walking this same fine line among many worlds. And when we remember that we are in fact large enough, ample enough, supple enough to contain the whole of our experience without lopping off what offends our spiritual ego, we take a giant step toward personal awakening. This leads to the, the second big shadow category, which is imposterhood. The sense of not being wholly who we say we are, of existing uh, half seen and half loved. At heart, every imposter feels like an abandoned child unseen by the world, beginning with the mother or the significant primary caretaker. 
we know what an enormous impact the mother's gaze has on the, on the healthy development and the sense of, of, of well-being, the sense of being loved in the child. We know we are loved and lovable by how we are loved by our mother. We know we exist, are seen, and formidable, substantial, by how we are acknowledged by those eyes. And when we are not acknowledged by the mother or our primary caregiver, it leads to an early sense of abandonment, which easily morphs into a sense of shame. In fact, abandonment, I go so far as to say, is a form of shame. It's easy when one feels unseen by the source of love to become someone who feels unseen no matter who's looking. To become a victim of love, a have-not, an untouchable. The shame one can feel over this, as I saw with my friend Carol, is often bone deep. It really goes to our deepest core sense of how it feels to be in the world, which is unsafe, disconnected, and disposable of. In fact, this is the number one complaint of people who come to work with me, which is feeling inauthentic, incomplete, misunderstood, misplaced, confused, disjointed, some variation of all of those, as if a crack ran right up the center of their being, pulling them apart from wholeness and happiness. This malaise, this crackedness, this dissociation goes by many names, you know, people talk about unhappy childhoods and, and so on. But it comes down to a universal sense of dislocation and estrangement. Imposters feel fundamentally alone with their secrets. If you're someone like this, a melancholic or, or somebody who's filled with a sense of loss, a kind of a half-empty soul, a yearner, a piner, then you know what I'm talking about. The irony about this way of life, this, this way of being, is that even though it doesn't feel good, it actually yields a lot of great art and poetry and spiritual practice. It keeps us very alive in ourselves at the same time that we suffer. Admitting one's longing is an emotional risk, yet vulnerability is the path of strength, as we know, and shame is the doorway to our greatest healing. Admitting how inauthentic we feel is very often the first step toward getting real, toward embodying our lives completely, stepping out of the shadow and allowing ourselves to be all of who we are, including the parts that may not be so spick and span. Next we come to greed and envy in the greatest hits of the shadow parade. All of us know how greedy we actually can be if we're honest. The same thing with envy, you know, the green-eyed monster, the part of us that would rather see another person fail than deal with the discomfort of hatred, the, the sort of frisson of hatred that overcomes us when we have to watch them succeed. You know, this is called schadenfreude. It's the delight at another person's failure. And as despicable as it can seem and how shameful as it can seem, schadenfreude is, actually, is one of the darker, more irresistible colors in the mandala of human life. There is no one who has not felt it. Few of us are not embarrassed by it, by the crassness of our own envy and, and the terrible thoughts that, that cross our mind, even our hearts, when we don't mean them. But we cannot deny that they're there, not all of the time, but now and then. The good news about envy and greed is that we can hold them and respond to them as comedy instead of tragedy. Comedy instead of tragedy. Oh, you want a cigarette? Big surprise. Or an ice cream or another man's husband? Or you want all of the money that your colleague got that should have been yours if they weren't such idiots? Right? We've all had these thoughts. There's no one who hasn't had these sorts of musings, you know, move, moving through life. And yet very few of us are willing to admit them even to ourselves because we think that they mean that we're bad people. In fact, they just mean that, they, that we are human beings. And when we can look at them that way as big surprise, I'm human, it takes on a comic tone. It lightens it up enormously. And we stop with the, the negative narcissism of beating ourselves up for being so horrible, just so much worse than anyone else. That's ridiculous. And finally, we come to the last 
piece of the shadow puzzle, which is the hunger for redemption and forgiveness. This is something that most of us feel very deeply within ourselves, even when we're not aware of it. It goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, morality needing to be sculpted in the presence of shadow in order for us to have a full awareness of what we keep hiding, in order for us to ground ourselves in reality and free ourselves of self-judgment. If we don't feel forgiven for who we are, fundamentally blessed, and that our lives have meaning, therefore. We cannot live full lives or love other people. But the blessing that we long for is our own blessing. You know, underneath all the stand-ins of not having been loved by our mothers or our fathers or being accepted in the world, it's our own forgiveness that we require. It's our own redemption of whatever pain or loss or suffering we've had and are carrying with us too heavily you're causing ourselves pain. That's what needs to be transformed into wisdom and resolve. We need to forgive ourselves for all of that. This goes to the question of worthiness and, and what Matthew Fox calls original blessing. Original blessing is a reversal of the story that we're bad, replaced by a creation myth that teaches us about our own greatness, resilience, imagination, and potential for freedom. Intimidated by the prospect of greatness, we hide this self-belief in the shadow. Very often, frightened of, too frightened of growing beyond our own limits. We conceal it in the darkness, this terrifying suspicion of how amazing we could actually be if we weren't so afraid of our own true nature. How visionary, how energized, and how blessed we actually are. Imagine how it would feel to be relieved of self-doubt and the weight of ambivalence that it creates in your life. Imagine not questioning yourself at every turn. Imagine trusting the movements of life, including your own intuition. That kind of knowing is what comes of the synthesis of shadow and light, the marriage of opposites, what, what was called in the uh, medieval church the coincidentia oppositorum the sacred marriage of opposites, bringing together the shadow and the light, the yang and the yin. From this marriage of opposites, this confrontation of shadow, and this integration of the parts of ourselves that we reject, an explosion of knowledge, of, of gnosis, comes that can awaken us from the old polarized way of being. Okay, there's an explosion that happens when we're willing to confront our own shadow. And it's an explosion of gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, awareness and awakening. I think of this as a kind of a third position, a holy position, beyond the opposites of a world split in two between good and bad. There's a third position. And that third position, place is where we grow to when we see through the lie that the mind creates in its dualizing madness. In this third position, shadow and light are never separate. Where we harvest the riches of what we keep hidden and recognize the depth and the soul of all that we push away with shame and disown under the cover of darkness. That's what happens when we are willing to open ourselves to the knowledge of the shadow and the awareness of the parts of ourselves that may not be perfect, but are nevertheless authentic and true to who we are. So ask yourself, what is hidden in your shadow that needs to be acknowledged and learned from? You know, what questions are being asked by your secret self, the one that you don't often give voice to, the one that, that talks to you at 3 o'clock in the morning? What questions does that self long to know the answer to? What is it that's being called out, that's calling out to be healed? What strengths and hopes and passions have you mowed over in the name of survival or convenience or common sense? Because we have to remember that we relegate to the shadow not only our negative parts, but very positive aspects of ourselves that just scare us or that we're not permitted in the home that we grew up in, for example. If you're a brilliant artist and your parents wanted you to be a lawyer, 
and you were an obedient child, chances are you relegated your creativity to the realm of the shadow, which is a surefire route to depression and loss of vitality. So it's about retrieving the positive aspect of uh, the strengths that we've buried in the shadow, as well as being willing to look at the parts of ourselves that are not so helpful or uh, leading to wisdom. Ask yourself, what is it that your body wants that you're not giving it? And how do you justify your own self-neglect? What about your heart? You know, what is your answer to Thomas More's question uh, about when the heart is freed from its benevolent captivity in ordinary morality, then what does it want? Where does freedom take it? Where would freedom take you if you let it? What taboo or forbidden secret truth do you harbor just beneath the surface of your awareness? And how can you access this intuitive knowing in order to enliven and enlighten you on the seeker's path? <laughs>